form. So let's let's go over here and look at this right now. We're all here. So, this huge grass-like plant that's about to flower all through here, and you've been seeing it all through the camp. That's just a pure field of it over there almost. Uh, but this is mugwort, which is Artemisia, uh, Artemisia vulgaris. Um, vulgaris just means common, and it's one of the most common plants in East North America. It is super invasive, it's allopathic, which means it produces, uh, it distributes chemicals in the soil that prevent other plants from growing near it. So it forms these pure fields, these pure communities. You'll see them all along roadsides, like over there. You see them in abandoned agricultural areas. This is a completely invasive introduced plant. This was brought over here as a medicinal plant very early on uh, by European settlers. It's related to wormwood, uh, which is the plant that absinthe is made from. It's also related to tarragon. And you can kind of see that when the plant gets real tall and articulated in its uh, flowering or pre-flowering stage, the leaves get real lanceolate and real sharp. But when it's young, it looks almost like parsley or something like that. Um, if everybody's really familiar with this plant, I won't pass it around or anything like that, but you can see it. It's all through here. I call it the queen of changes because it, goes, it starts out like that. Then it gets more finite, almost like an oak leaf. The lobes get deeper. But all throughout its stages, it has the same characteristic flavor and smell, which is probably would we'd associate it with the bathroom rather than the, the culinary table, I think. Uh, it's got a strong, bitter, aromatic scent to it. And you see it, it's, it's perennial too, so you, no matter how much you mow it down, it's going to keep coming back. But this is the, this, they obviously cut this area down sometime in the early, in late spring or early summer, so this is just popping back from the rhizome, and then this is the mature plant, which is about to start flowering. I think there's some, yeah, there's flowers forming right there. It's a really in innocuous flower. It's not very uh, dramatic. It's not something you see, oh, look at that, the Artemisia is flowering. How beautiful. You know, it's got like a green, greenish flower. It's like ragweed. It's innocent. You don't notice it. You don't even realize it's flowering half the time. You just think, oh, it looks a little different now. Um, but this is a classic plant that is absolutely free game. Like, if you went out in the field and you chopped down 70 bushels of mugwort, everyone's only going to love you more. This, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with taking a million of these from everywhere. I mean, it's, it's, is it's, are its uses really extensive? Eh, they're more extensive than people think. In the spring, it's a really nice green. If you cook it, it actually, the bitterness resolves. The flavor is a lot more sweet. I make a potage in the spring every year, which is just like a French country soup, take potatoes, a bunch of mugwort green and I mean I'm talking about you know a decent amount and make a nice soup out of it puree it whatever it's pretty good it's mild tasting at that point in the year as it gets stronger it's much more aromatic but then you can do things like um, a lot of chefs I know will do this and I've done it too is cut off a lot of these flowering tops and then uh, smoke stuff over it wrap uh, fish in it you know create that kind of uh, you can make vinegar out of it you can infuse it in things and stuff like that but again, there's way more of it than we're ever going to conquer by harvesting it for food. I mean, that's that's just a, a no-brainer. But it is the classic example of a plant that is like, there is no reason not to collect this plant. There's no protection on it. With mushrooms, again, like I said, it's a little different. Like fungi, you're not doing a lot of damage by collecting a lot of fungi, but plants are totally different. Before you collect any plant for food, you should know what its role is. It's not just like, oh, this is available, this is food, let's eat it. You know, it's got, it's got a very specific role to play, and it might be that it's a very tender native plant. In America, we, in Eastern North America, we have two plants that I consider super over-harvested. Uh, one of them is like almost on the verge of collapse, which is American ginseng. It's been collected and sold and sold to Japan and sold to China and sold all around the world, and now it's becoming more popular as a medicinal plant for use in America, so the situation is even worse. I don't post pictures of American ginseng when I find it. I don't talk about American ginseng. I, I would talk about it in a negative way. Do not collect this plant. There's a dwarf form too. I've seen people collect that. No, uh-uh. That plant is in deep danger of disappearing from our understory. It is a classic native plant. It's, it deserves our respect. Take a picture of it. Talk about it as a, as a beautiful native wildflower. But do not collect American ginseng. The other one that really bothers me is ramps. Mm. I have a real problem with ramps. I have a problem with, I don't care if you find a field of ramps. Don't dig up buckets of the bulbs. It's, there's what no a, reason to. What about cutting the leaves? Cutting the leaves is fine. And the best way to cut the leaves is wait until the plant photosynthesizes. Yeah. So uh, when the leaf is really big and full and you just start to see a little bit of yellow, 
go ahead in with the scissors. That's all I collect is ramp sleeves for about four years now. I just don't touch the bulbs. In my county, there are a handful of ramps patches, and they are tiny. I mean, they are really small. And there are ones that I go, there's one that's right on a bike trail. And every year I consider, should I just come in here and cut these all down so nobody finds this? <laughs> the bulbs will stay alive, the plants will get another year, you know, and then I go, no, you can't do that either. You gotta let them flower, etc. So it's, uh, that's the sharp contrast to a plant like mugwort. You know, you have ramps, people selling them. I mean, I've seen them, and now they're in Whole Foods in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's shameful. And they're just throwing them in, you know, and they're bulbs. Wow. If you buy, if you happen to buy a ramps at your farmer's market or something, one thing you can do with them is you can cut you can cut the leaf and just use the leaf and then plant the bulb in the ground. Mm -hmm. Also, if it's got the dangly tendrils, the like sort of, uh, I, there's a botanical name for it which eludes me at the moment, but uh, if you just cut it off at the base, you can replant the tendrils and a lot of times you'll get ramps back. Uh, some of that, that bike path I mentioned, I dug up a couple of the ramps that were getting crushed by bikers and planted them in my garden. Now I have ramps in my garden. They come back every year. You can use the leaves every year if you want, but it takes seven years for a ramp to go from seed to a fully grown plant. Seven years. So when you dig up one of those bulbs, that's X number of years you're eliminating. You know, it could have been five years it's been in the ground, and now it's gone. Do you think that when you find them in like Whole Foods or something, they are foraged or are they farmed? There's a few people that are farming ramps right now, but it's not, it's not considered a lucrative crop because if you go into Appalachia, there's fields and fields of them, and you can just go out there with your homeboys and dig up buckets mm -hmm. and buckets of them, and nobody sees you and nobody cares. Mm -hmm. And they have big ramps festivals all the time in Appalachian uh, areas and stuff like that, which I don't necessarily disapprove of, but maybe they could use that festival and that to highlight yeah. other native plants or other useful plants or even invasive plants. I know that's dreaming, but um, but no, they're just going to keep digging up the bulbs and deep frying them. So. And I, I got to say, from a culinary perspective, I've, I work with a lot of chefs. I know a lot of really intense, serious culinary people that are way more creative and innovative as cooks than I am. All of them will tell me the same thing now, which is that the leaf is where all the flavor is. Yeah. Yeah. You, you make an infused oil with that. You dry, What I do is I just dry a couple buckets of them. I grind it with salt. I, have, I eat ramps all year round because I just put a little ramp salt on it. It tastes amazing. It tastes way better than any stir fry in a bulb with eggs does. You know, it's, it's a totally... Um, much more sustainable way to use the, the, the plant. Go ahead. With rams this year, Cam and I just blended them in a food processor with olive oil and yep. froze them in ice cube trays. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, like Harry taught for, me that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's the, cla that's the ram soil. That's classic. Yeah. yeah, it's just a, you throw one, one in a soup and you're, you're yeah, good to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and doesn't it beat like, having a, a big pile of these bulbs and going like, oh, what the hell am I going to do with them all, yeah. you know? Like, I got to deal with this now. I got, you know, I dug all these up and now what am I going to do, you know? Um, so, uh, we got a group now, it looks like. Um, so, what I want to say in a broad way, which kind of relates to what I was just talking about is, again, with mushrooms, let's leave mushrooms out of the equation. Plants are different. You have to understand why that plant is there. Almost every plant that we eat for wild food, the bit, all the heavy hitters, all the big useful plants, all the plants that have multiple parts that we eat throughout the season, with a couple of notable exceptions like milkweed, which is over here somewhere, uh, all, almost all of these plants are introduced invasive species that were brought here by European settlers. They're not native plants, they're not in the woods. Don't go in the woods. There's no food in the woods, except mushrooms. Uh, there's a couple things that you can use in the woods, but very little. And most of what grows, grows there that is edible is usually a native wildflower. It's usually something like ginseng or ramps. Uh, it may not be on the scale of that, and it may be over-harvested like that, but it's, you know, like, I, I see people using, um, there's a, a spotted wintergreen, which is a, not like, you know, you find wintergreen in big patches and bogs in the pinelands and stuff like that. It's a common plant in this area it's fairly common. My area it isn't. I never collect wintergreen in Huntington County because I don't know of any patches. I found one spot. Um, but there's a spotted wintergreen that goes in the woodlands and I see people digging that up and using food and the thing is like it's a spring ephemeral but well, it's actually more of a summer flower but it's a very minimal plant. There's very little of it out there. Like even in areas where it's abundant it's not that abundant. You know I see maybe a couple dozen plants in like one patch of woods. And there's just no reason to use it. It doesn't have any really distinctive or interesting flavor that's different from ordinary wintergreen, which you can harvest sustainably. Um, and it's, yeah, again, you have, when your focus has to be what, what is the role of the plant in the landscape. Uh, and again, the, the ones that we're using and the best, the best things for use are things like dandelion, you know? 
you could never harvest too much dandelion. <laughs> you can take as much as you like. And if you start to learn how to use it creatively and with a little bit of thought, instead of just going, oh, I know that's a dandelion because it's flowering. Let me cut these leaves off and eat it. Oh my God, they're so bitter. You know, when you know how the plant grows and you start to recognize it at its younger stages, then you go, oh, I know these leaves are tender now. They're good now. You know, you see them, you start to get, and you, and you learn when you know a plant, you can taste it. Don't go tasting random things. But when you know what a plant actually looks like and you see it through its changes, um, so I want everybody to take a look at the mugwort plant and just really look at it. Like, walk through here, and I'll show you if you're if you're curious, if you're not sure what it is. It's, it's this. It's not this. That's horse nettle. I'll pass this around, actually. This is an important one to know. The leaves might be familiar to people if you've ever grown eggplants, if you've ever grown tomatoes. Um, it's prickly, so be careful. Yeah. Uh, this is a really common weed in uh, disturbed ground and on the borders of old fields. Is it a nightshade? It's a nightshade, exactly. It's in the same. It's actually in the same genus, not even just the same family, but the same genus as tomato and eggplant. So it's not related to nettle. It's not related to nettle at all. It's called a horse nettle because it's got thorns on it. And it produces a, a flower. I think it's one flowering right over there, which is usually white or purple with a yellow center. And it produces a fruit that's a lot like a cherry tomato, a yellow cherry tomato. You see them in the late summer, early fall. You can see starting to flower now. So it's going to be um, and they persist through the winter. If you walk through an old field that's all straws, all dead, and dead grass, you'll see these little yellow fruits just holding on. And that should be a good sign. Why doesn't anyone want to eat them? Why don't animals want to eat them? Why are they still sitting in this field? That's, I mean, you know, there's hardly any forage for animals in. October, November, you know, uh, and you, you walk through a field and you see all these little yellow fruits everywhere. You go, why aren't the squirrels eating these? Because they're smart. They know that's a bullshit plant. They don't want to eat it. Uh, <laughs> this is actually a native plant. So I do have a little bit of respect for it. It's Solanum carolin, carolin, sense, carolin uh, It's native to eastern uh, North America, toxic to humans, but you'd have to eat a ton of it to get sick from it. But it's a good one to know as far as a toxic sucker. But uh, again, let's like, we can kind of walk through here and everybody kind of take a look at mugwort because the biggest lesson to learn about plants is not, oh, you look at a plant once and you go, this is what this is. Oh, okay, I know what this is now. I'm, I'm good to go. Uh-uh. Plants are shapeshifters, man. They change their form all the time. They change depending on their soil conditions. They might flower a different color because of their soil conditions. Mm. They could do all kinds of things. And there's no better example than mugwort. This does not look anything like that. No. Nothing. Nothing like it. It's the same plant, though. But to see how it changes, see how it gets, there you can see the similarity. There's a little bit younger, there's even younger still. <laughs> it gets sharper, it gets, uh, the, the lobes become deeper and deeper, and then finally as, the, as it gets higher and higher, the old leaves wither off. Yeah, oh, and this has really firm, heavy stalks. I actually use mugwort most in winter. I take the residual flower heads, and they're uh, totally dry. They still have a really nice, aroma, that, that aromatic presence is still there, but it's a lot fainter. I just throw them in a um, roasting pan, put some potatoes over them with the oil. Ooh, it's really good, right? You wouldn't think so if you tasted this leaf right now. You'd go, why would you eat that? It's disgusting. Because um, it's strongly bitter at this point of the year. But that's, again, that's the thing. The plants, they, they metamorphosize, you know? Just because a plant is edible doesn't mean you want to eat it. It certainly doesn't mean you should eat it, but that's a, obviously the, the ethical issue that we're going to talk about, too. But yeah, everybody kind of just putter around for a minute so I can stop talking for a second. <laughs> and take a look at this plant. Really hold it, get to know it, crush it up. Sniff it. If, you're, if, you, if you see something else and you're not sure what it is, ask me. If you don't, if you, <laughs> don't grab random things. <laughs> Most important thing at first with, with wild plants absolutely, is to know the toxic plants. The first thing you should do is go to the store and figure out what you don't want to eat. Like, what, what's the poisonous mushroom that's most common in our, my area? It's destroying angel, right? Yeah, that's the first mushroom I learned because I had to teach myself mushrooms, so I was scared shitless of mushrooms. And the first one I found was, and you said too, right, Nora, the first one you yeah. found was destroying angel. You know, it's very distinctive, but that's what you got to know. You got to know what, I wish there was hemlock here. I would show you guys water hemlock or, or poison hemlock would be great because that's very important to, to know. And yeah, that's wild parsnip. We're going to talk about them both together because they're in the same family. So that's wild carrot. Yeah.
Okay, this is the number one most dangerous family of plants in our area. Nightshades are close, uh, they're, but they're really most of the poisonous nightshades. You've got to eat a lot of berries and they don't taste good. There's a climbing nightshade plant that's really common in my area. It looks nothing like the horse nettle we just saw, but that has toxic berries. But I think they said a small child would need about 500 to die. And that's, oh, that's a lot of really bitter fruit for a kid to eat. So, but this, this family is a different story entirely. It's the Apiaceae, the carrot family or the celery family, contains the most lethal plant in our country, which is water hemlock. And the flower of water hemlock don't look a whole lot different from this very close and a lot of APACA have very similar flower umbel. This is wild parsnip. Okay, see it's similar. This used to be called, the family used to be called umbelliferae because the flowers are held in an umbel. So when you see this, that's an umbel, like an umbrella. When you see that shape, that's a pretty good sign that you got. The other thing that's real distinctive is they often have, if you look at celery, which I think you all have, the stalks of the, of the plant when it moves into flower tend to be grooved and they have a kind of, like if you guys can look at this parsnip when you get a chance, they have a kind of a heavy, grooved, thick kind of way of growing that's fairly distinctive. Um, they're also a lot of times very aromatic. Now, the other really common toxic plant besides water hemlock, which is actually a native plant, and that is very, very toxic. I mean, I'm going to tell you, do not mess around with this family. Like, you got to know 1,000% if a carrot is a carrot before you eat it. Because water hemlock, they don't actually know how small a dosage of water hemlock is enough to kill you. Because the toxicity is so intense that they haven't done a test. A very small amount is of, of just a leaf is potentially quite fatal. The uh, more common hemlock, which is the introduced one, which is a European plant, just like this parsnip and just like this carrot. And these are... These are nothing more than the feral forms of the carrots we plant. If you leave a carrot in your garden and you don't harvest it, it's going to turn into a wild carrot. It's going to create offspring that are identical to this plant because it's the same exact species, the same genus, same species, everything. Same thing with the parsnip. Um, they, they're, they're just the feral versions of the parsnips that we planted when we first settled here. And they, now they grow all along. If you've seen these guys probably on the roadside around here, they're, again, really common agricultural plants. Um, what are a uh, regular poison hemlock I see a lot. It's a very different looking plant when it's mature. It looks kind of evil. It's got purple blotches on it. It's real tall. It's real um, rank smelling. You crush a leaf and it's, it smells like garbage. In the winter though, that plant does not smell bad. In fact, it smells almost exactly like wild chervil, which is another one of these. I've seen those two side by side in the winter and I know which is which, but I don't see which is which until I really get up close. They're very, very close and indistinct. And most of the time you want to harvest a wild plant when it's tender, when it's young. So you have to be sort of extra careful with that. But once you've learned what wild carrot looks like, and when you really start to look at these plants, I w like I said, I wish there was a hemlock here because we could see side by side exactly why, why they're different. This is pretty distinctive. Mm -hmm. Nobody does this except wild carrot. This cluster of sort of orangey brown seeds together. Uh, if you crush them and taste them, they have a bit of a coriander seed fragrance. If you've ever used, that's how I use them as a, as a culinary item. I use them as a seed, uh, similar to the way I would use a coriander seed. And parsnip is the same. Wild parsnip seed is actually one of my favorite spices. It has a, it's the basis of about half of my curries. It's got this like spicy, intense, orangey kind of bitter uh, fragrance and flavor to it. But I wouldn't advise, well, we're a little okay right now, but another point with this family is a lot of them aren't just poisonous. A lot of them are edible, but they're, they're photophytotoxic. So basically what happens is, if you had a big field of wild parsnips and you go out on a sunny day, you go, I'm gonna cut these things down. I'm sick of looking at these things. You, you cut them down and you get the sap on your skin. It can actually burn in direct sunlight and cause rather annoying burns and some of them will be persistent for a couple of weeks. If you do that with another related plant called giant hogweed, you might disfigure yourself for the rest of your life. So again, these guys are not to be trifled with. This whole family is, you want extensive research before you eat any of them. Now, having said that, I'm pretty sure this is a wild carrot. So if you guys want to get a sense of the fragrance, I'll pass a couple of Just kind of crush up a seed 
Uh, another thing you can do is you can smell the leaves because the leaves have a pretty distinct carroty kind of smell. But it, this is known as Queen Anne's Lace. Queen Anne's Lace is the, yeah, we call the Queen Anne's Lace is the wildflower name for it. Confusingly, in the UK, Queen Anne's Lace is wild chervil. Yeah, there you go. And wild chervil is a plant, I don't see it in this part of the country, uh, but near me it's starting to take over the entire Delaware River watershed area. So. Oh, yeah. And it's become, uh, there's pure stands of it now everywhere. When it, it like curls up into the nest, yeah, yeah. Are, do the seeds go, I've heard of people like collecting them like, there, are there red like seeds or fruits? Well there, there's, in the flower there's a, um, very often there's a, a red or a black flower at the center. But I would say about a good third of them don't, don't have it, but you'll see that if you pass it around. There's a, there's a, one of the mythologies about Queen Anne's Lace is that it's the prick of blood where she pricked her finger. Oh, yeah, while she was making a doily. While she was making a doily out of right. the yeah, wild carrot, you know, because that sounds pro, real plausible. But, um, yeah, I wish there was some, a little bit of the younger leaves. You see the wild parsnip in its adult stage, but, um, actually, it'd be easier to see over here. This is the young one. Right. So this is a wild parsnip, and again, I wouldn't, it's only the overcast that I would even pull this plant. When I collect the wild parsnip seeds, I do it either in in the evening or when it's raining. Because uh, it doesn't really wash the fragrance of the mouth. What's wrong? Nice. Yeah. That's a great one. Yeah, yeah, that's one of, this is every kid's Everywhere. favorite, every kid's favorite wild plant right here, if you guys don't know this. A lot of people go, oh, clover. Uh, it's wood, sour, wood sorrel, oxalis stricta. Um, it's in probably a lot of your gardens. If you have a garden, you'll see wood sorrel leaves pop up. What about the, the spear-shaped leaves? Is that also wood sorrel or is that sheep sorrel? Oh, no, no, that's sheep sorrel. That's Rumex uh, acetocella, which is related has, to the docks. It also has oxalic acid. Yeah, it has oxalic acid, which is... Oxalic acid is a big... Um, you'll, if you start getting into foraging and wild plants, you're going to run across it's people with stern warnings about oxalic acid. Mm -hmm. No, I just don't eat a lot of it, right? Exactly, but, but oxalic acid is also present in spinach. Right. I mean, you just you can't you don't want to eat so much of one thing that it. Uh, and it <laughs> this is great. <laughs> um, but that's a good. It's a good. It's a good thing to think about. It's also a good thing to demystify a little bit because that you know again it's present in a lot of vegetables. It's sort of like the thing about you know there's some that have potential to cause. Uh, kidney stones. That's really the big danger with oxalic acid is that it's going to cause kidney stones. But again, there's tons of it in all kinds of different vegetables. I mean, even the cultivated sorrel has the same amount. Uh -huh. um, the Rumex that you mentioned, the sheep sorrel, everybody loves that one too. It has the same kind of taste, that lemony taste. That is the presence of oxalic acid. Mm -hmm. It's also in the other Rumex plants, which are dock. Uh, the, the two docks, well, there's a, there's a lot more than two, but the two that are common are curly dock and broadhead dock. But if those don't have broadleaf duck. You don't eat those uh, oh, leaves. Yeah, absolutely oh, you, do. Oh yeah. Can. yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh. Yeah. And I thought I, it was and just the root. The something. root is used as medicine. Um, I eat the seeds too, but the seeds are quite bitter. But they mm -hmm. can be used as a, a grain, like a meal substitute. Really crunchy. Um, yeah. 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 Well, you can separate the yeah, the chaff. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You, there's a way to grind them or crush them where you can uh, separate them. Out. So, yeah. But yeah, let, let's. Uh, this is safe enough, I think, to pass around. But this is the young wild parsnip. There's a b big patch of them over there by those bar uh, by the, the raspberries they're growing too. So we can look at them there. Um, my apologies to everyone if I'm not like moving around enough. I just kind of wanted to show you guys that this is where all the food is. It's in the disturbed open area. Uh, um, I don't. I don't know that if you cook it, the, the oxalic acid is removed. What I, what I usually don't cook sorrel because it turns a fairly unappetizing color of brown. Right. I was thinking of some uh, lamb porter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Canopodium. Yeah, that would be nice to see if that was here, but I don't. I don't believe it is. But while I'm standing here, uh, unfortunately, I don't see any that's either flowering or putting seed pods. But um, this plant right over here. It's pretty important. It's a pretty quintessential food plant, and it's a good one to split the divide now because we're talking about all these things that are, again, you collect all the wild carrot you want, it's fair game. Uh, this is not. This plant is very different, but it's on a, I call it's on a sliding scale, okay? It's not ramps, but it's not mugwort. This is common milkweed, uh, Asclepius cerreica, and it's, the only milkweed, first of all, that you should eat. There are other ones that are possibly edible, but they're not common enough at all. 
They are very, like I see swamp milkweed around, it's supposedly edible, I'm not gonna eat it. There's no reason to. It's not gonna have any flavor that's different from common milkweed. And maybe there's a maybe there's a, something to the sense that, uh, that, that a certain butterfly might be drawn to that because it's a different species, because they can also use it. Now the big thing with milkweed that everybody knows is it's the only source of food for the monarch caterpillar. And the monarchs, adult monarchs are drawn to the flowers, they lay their eggs. They already came around. Um, it'd be great to see a caterpillar on one of these so you guys can see them. They look a little bit like a swallowtail caterpillar, which you may have seen in your garden on parsley or on carrot. Uh, they, they're huge. I, when I get one of uh, those guys in my garden, I take it and I put it on a wild carrot. Take it off the parsley and put it on a wild carrot. Um, if you see them on our caterpillar, don't collect any milkweed. But the myth, the myth with milkweed is that we shouldn't collect it at all because it's a food source for the monarch caterpillar. Well, the thing is the monarch caterpillar eats the leaves. We don't eat the leaves. We eat, the, we eat the, the flowers, we eat the flower buds before the flower forms, and we eat the pods. And some of us who grow it eat the shoots. Um, it's a perennial. Okay, if I chop this milkweed down, it's gonna pop right back up. It's not going anywhere. You're not killing the plant by collect, even if you collect the shoot. In fact, if you grow it, this is one thing I really advocate growing milkweed. First of all, you get a, you're gonna get butterflies in your yard, and you're gonna get bees if you like bees. Um, you don't wanna put it maybe right next to your house. Or, or your front door, and it's, if you got somebody allergic to bees, I wouldn't plant milkweed. Because milkweed, again, everybody knows the monarch, but I don't think there's a wild plant that's native to this country that I see more different kinds of insect on than milkweed. I will come across a stand of milkweed and see nine, ten different kinds of bug on it. I mean, it is a real popular plant. They love the aroma, uh, lots of different insects use it. Um, it's got two different kinds of aphids that prey on it. Um, in fact, if you see some orange spots anywhere, that's the presence of aphids. So would it attract unwanted insects then, if it was in proximity to your garden? Yeah, I mean, well, uh, to be honest, the only one that I've found it attracts that is unwanted for me is the aphid, which preys on the plant itself, and there's no way to stop it from, yeah. from, from finding those. Uh, the other big bugaboo myth about milkweed is that it's toxic, that the white sap indicates toxicity. Mm -hmm. White sap does sometimes indicate toxicity. There are, there are toxic plants that produce white sap. However, dandelion produces white sap. Wild lettuce produces white sap. Mm -hmm. There's about a dozen plants in the aster family that have white sap. And milkweed has white sap, its sap is not poisonous. In fact, you can taste its sap and you can taste that it's not bitter. That's the other myth, that milkweed is so bitter you have to cook it to within an inch of its life to eat it. No, no, you can eat milkweed raw. Mm -hmm. Some people may make may, may cause it's, it's made me vomit. Uh, it's, yeah, it was about, under, that's, undercooked that's, milkweed. That's what has, I was like, about made, to say. Made vomit. So, I, I mean, I ate quite a bit of it. I probably ate like twenty pods or yeah. something like that. That was my next comment. Was that <laughs> like things like chicken of the woods? There are people that may get a reaction from it, <laughs> but from what I've seen, they're in the in the minority. I still eat it. It's delicious. Yeah. Well, I cook, just cook it. More. Just cook it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got to find your own. You got to find your own space with any plant like that. Like. Well, well, both me and the person I ate it with both vomited. Really? But because of it, we found a really nice chicken of the woods pack. You didn't eat any like psilocybin before you did, did you? Like, no. like, was vomiting, like, oh my god, this chicken of the woods is beautiful. Like, it's super fresh. <laughs> like, so we replaced it with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, again, yes. You know, some people are allergic to uh, sumac because they're allergic to the cashew family, which sumac is in. So you're not all edible, safe wild food plants are safe for everybody. That's a very. I'm glad you brought that up. Is kind of where I was headed anyway. Yeah. Very important to 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 just to make that distinction. It's not. Um, you know. Now, as far as milkweed being sustainable, this is a real patch in which we get into arguments. I got death threats once because I posted edible a, a, a post on deep fried milkweed. Literally, really? this woman what? said, "Yeah, no." She literally wow. threatened to kill me. And I go. I said to her, "I go." I go, I live, I, li I go, where I live, there's a real lot of milkweed in abandoned far fields that the farmers right. actually let grow. We actually have a really huge population of milkweed. It's in great stands. I'll go in there and pick a couple of pods and yeah, I'll see some butterflies and stuff. It's great, right? No problem. I go, if I live 20 miles east of here, I wouldn't collect milkweed. She goes, I know where you live. It's not sustainable. <laughs> okay. <laughs> People get a little butthurt about it. So. Yeah. Um, but you know, another reason is that, you know, uh, uh, far be it for me to say it, I love monarchs, but they're really just the pandas of Lepidoptera. I mean, they're really beautiful. That's why we care so much about them, let's be honest. Like, there's plenty of other things out there that are going extinct, like, especially a lot of parasitic animals and parasitic insects that nobody gives a freaking shit about, you know? So, but yes, again, plant milkweed, throw it in your garden. It's like asparagus, you'll have it every year. But it's better than asparagus, because you can eat it, like, you get five different foods from it. You get the shoots, the flower buds, the flowers, the pods, and then inside the pods is 
cheese. Cheese. Yeah. Vegan cheese. Yeah. When the <laughs> pods first emerge, you pop them open, and um, if you've seen milkweed in the winter, you see how it's like silk. Mm -hmm. Another name for it is silkweed. And it has hard seeds lost in the silk. They get fluffy and it blows all over the landscape and it looks really beautiful. When that silk first forms, it's like cheese. It's like a loose farmer's cheese. Uh, I pull it out of the pods all the time. I'll stuff the pods with something, throw the cheese in my pasta. It's excellent. Um, but again, you may find you need to cook it a little more than other people. I recommend cooking it first. I recommend cooking it for a little while first and then tasting it and seeing it. And just having a little bit. Exactly, yeah. Excellent point. Just thinking that too, with, with any new ingredient, I learned this as a, I actually learned this as a mushroom test. I turned back, because I came to mushrooms later than plants, I turned back and retroactively apply this now to plants, which is you eat a really small quantity, well cooked, give yourself 24 hours. Don't drink any alcohol, don't take any psilocybin, <laughs> don't, uh, don't, don't trip, um, just, just eat a little bit of it. Whenever you introduce a wild food into your environment, into, your, into the environment of your body, you want to use a very small quantity of it at first and just see if you have any reaction to it. Because, again, we don't know, you know, everybody knows about nut allergies because everybody eats nuts. But everybody doesn't eat milkweed, so we don't know about some people that may react to it and mm. may make them quite uncomfortable. And that's never anything you want. You don't have to eat anything. Just because it's edible doesn't mean you have to eat it. Um, so you said this is, what's the characteristic? This is a type of milkweed that it's... Is this the only edible one? Or what, what um, it's not that it's the only edible one, but it's the only one I recommend eating because it's the only one that's been really well documented. Okay. And it's the only one that exists, at least in my area, in sufficient enough quantity to eat it. Now, there's a real common plant in my area, especially I don't see any here, but that looks very, very similar to milkweed, which is called dogbane. And they don't look anything alike when they're flowering. They don't look anything alike when they produce seed pods. They do look a lot alike when they first emerge. And for me, the telltale, I... I mean, I've been collecting milkweed for years and years, and every once in a while, those little shoots of dog band, I go, ah, and I go, no. Um, and I know now not to, but the, when I was learning it, sometimes there's a lot of different characteristics that can be used to distinguish it. I won't bore you with them. Uh, if anyone has Samuel Thayer's book on milkweed, uh, or you know his book where he talks about milkweed, he's got a whole chart with them all. Mm -hmm. um, my, my tell with milkweed versus dog band when I'm figuring out what they are from the shoots is dog band sap tastes bitter. Milkweed sap does not taste bitter. Put a little tiny bit on your finger and taste it. You're, you're not going to die from it. But if you ate big buckets of dog, dog bane, you would you would be quite ill. And a good fiber plant. What is the distinction characteristic or name of this plant specifically? Oh, uh, this it's common milkweed is Asclepius. Is the milkweeds and the Syriaca is its uh, name, which makes absolutely no sense because it's not from Syria or anywhere in that part of the world that's from here. I'm not sure how it got that name exactly. I should do that. That would be good to know. Um, oh, we're going to talk about one of my favorites over here. Let's move on. Another five feet. It's so good. This is like, again, a native plant, but it's a really good native plant. Um, and it's a really sustainable native plant because it's a mint family. Like yeah, the mint family, the oil the if anybody's grown mint in their gardens, you, get like that's, you know that that plant like takes over. Is it correct to say the mint family? Is mint family? Is it correct, correct? Yeah. Because it's like, isn't the mint part of another family, like the, what is it, salvia? Or? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, well, salvia, yeah, salvia is a genus, that's sage. Okay. Yeah, the broader family is called uh, Labiatae, used to be called, now it's called uh, Lamiaceae. It okay. used to be called Labiatae because if you look at any mint flower, even one as crazy as this, you'll see it has a, a lip. Wait, mint is nothing, but it's just commonly known as Yeah, yeah, it's commonly known as a mint, just kind of like that's the carrot family, but carrot's just one of the, okay. the genera within the, fa the broader family. Well, there's some more parsnip over here too, if you guys want to get familiar with it, because this is, this is the stage at which you would dig it. Mm. And you would eat the root, and again, you would be really careful while you handled it. But yeah. um, that's a, one thing that's not immediately obvious or talked about a lot in wild food is that you, you know, like I, I see people all the time that they dig up a flowering plant and try to eat the, the root. Uh, uh all the energy in that plant yeah, is in the flower. Right, right. It's in producing flowers and producing seed. The, the root is going to be like wooden and tasteless because it's got no, there's no juice left in it. So you dig the roots in the spring, dig the roots in the fall. Um, but Monarda. Now, mint family is great. Mint family is really great for foragers. Really great. Why is the mint family so great, Mallory? The mint family is great because it's really, really distinctive. Mm -hmm. The stems are always square. square. Not square looking, not square feeling. Properly square. When you cut them, 
open, I tore it, so that doesn't really help anybody. <laughs> uh, when you cut them open, they will be square. They're always opposite leaves. It just so if people um, aren't already familiar with this concept, the, the difference between opposite and alternate is pretty key in botany. An alternate leaf is like this goldenrod. One leaf, one leaf, one leaf. This is actually kind of world, but we won't get into that. One leaf, one leaf, one leaf. That's the main two ways leaves grow. They grow up or they grow opposite. But, but what is a leaf? The difference between a leaf and a leaflet. Right. Well, like again. <laughs> but find I can throw let's people leave the fine off, details though. for walk number two. Um, we'll talk about general stuff right now. Because the mint family is really good. Because the mint family is it's everywhere. It exists as wild plants. It also exists as plants that are gone feral. And it's already in your garden. So if you have a garden and you have mint, go look at it. Observe it. Uh, the other characteristics are be it's usually downy, small hairs, soft hairs. You are milking that. Well, wow, doesn't that smell so good? <laughs> so good. You have not stopped. Um, it's like it's like you got your own little perfume. Therapy, it's re it really is. I know. I, sassafras for me is the one. When I'm walking through the woods, I grab those sassafras leaves. I just crush them. Oh, it's like it's, it really is. It's like you get a rush. Um, this, however, is an amazing plant. Okay, it's a native plant. This is called Monarda fistulosa. Uh, if you, there's another plant that a lot of people will know that has red flower that looks very similar called Monarda didyma. That's usually known as bee balm. We usually call this one wild bergamot. I don't know why. I think common names are kind of stupid, but I'll, I'll stick with that for now. This is like the best oregano you've never had. The leaves aren't great right now because, again, all the energy of the plant isn't producing the flower heads right now. But one thing that's really cool about this plant is if you miss collecting the, the leaves in the spring when they're really fresh and, and you know, the, I, to me, I don't use this, it's too strong a plant to use as a fresh herb. I dry it and put that on pizza. I mean, it's like, it is, it's like oregano, it's the best, it's like a spicy oregano almost. I think that one, that's a uh, better variety than for a spice. Didyma is really good too, but the thing about didyma that's different is didyma, when you dry it, is almost like basil. And you can't dry basil. So I use didyma as like a dried basil like type herb. They're similar. They're similar. I mean, and you know, sometimes I'll dry the didyma and it's more like the wild bergamot just because the concentration of oils in that plant is a little different. Um, but the cool thing I was going to say about this plant is after it flowers, the flower heads drop off and they get, there's a brown one over there which kind of you can kind of see. Yeah, they kind of like, it becomes indistinct and it, res it, it resolves back into the meadow. And then in September, these little fresh leaves pop up along the stem. Mm -hmm. I don't know of a lot of mints that do that unless you cut them back, but this one does it, and it's fantastic. You go get some fresh leaves just if you missed it the first time around. Mm -hmm. um, you can use the flower heads too. I've used them to make like a vinegar or infuse things and stuff like that. That's, mm -hmm. You're going to hear me say that about a million times. You can infuse mm -hmm. stuff with it. Yeah, we know. Okay. Um, <laughs> so these, these leaves are pretty yeah, fresh. Yeah, see, these leaves are pretty fresh, and because this is in kind of a mode area, or a maintained area. It's probably been whacked a couple of times. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's probably got some. Oh, just, that was very untoward. I just like attacked that thing. Um, yeah, they are really strong. Yeah, yeah, they're they're potent. Yeah, I don't. Again, I don't really like it as a fresh herb very much. Um, oh, let me pass this one. Um, but uh, but I love the aroma of it and the fragrance. And bees go nuts over it. So it's a great one to plant in your garden. It's also fairly sustainable again because it's a mint family member. When you chop off all the mint, it just comes. Mm -hmm. It actually often comes up bigger because it splits um, and again it, it'll be in the same area every year I don't see as much of it around here as I see but in my meadows it's all over the place I mean there's just thousands of these plants yeah it's like it, the bumblebees an, really love another it one, there's yeah. some uh, different types of butterflies that really like it yep. yeah it's very popular my, and my, the ones in my yard are that and the milkweed I have a bunch of clusters in here. We can do goldenrod. Everybody know goldenrod? This is a plant that gets a bad rap. This is another native plant, but it's so abundant. I mean, you can go crazy with goldenrod, and it's a strong uh, plant, so you don't really tend to use a lot of it. Um, the big myth about goldenrod is that it causes hay fever. Goldenrod does not cause hay fever for two reasons. First of all, the the pollen is insect borne, it's not wind borne, so it's not blowing into your nose. Um, the other reason is that the grains of pollen are actually too big to fit in, into your system. You can't inhale them. They're huge. And you can learn that it's insect borne very easily if you go to goldenrod when it's in flower. In the evening, you'll see bees curled up inside it. You know, just 
just sleeping in it. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't collect goldenrod in the morning. <laughs> it's like I'll, I'll go out there and I'll go, wait a minute, yeah. bees, it's, a bee, it's a bee's bed. Um, no, ragweed is the plant, which I think is over there somewhere. Um, ragweed is the plant that causes hay fever. Uh, and ragweed is uh, the reason why goldenrod gets the wrap. Well, the goldenrod's really bright, it's really showy. Ragweed grows beneath it, it has a completely innocuous green flower. You'd never notice, you wouldn't even know it was blooming. Um, so goldenrod became the whipping post. Uh, this is my favorite tea, uh, or one of my favorite teas is goldenrod. Uh, gets me through the winter. Um, you dry the flowering heads, make a tea out of that. It's bitter. It's not. You're not going to be. You know. It's not Snapple. Um, but it's it's really strong medicinally speaking. I'm not a big and I'm not a big medicinal plants guy. Like I don't know all the indications of all these different plants and things like that. There are a, few, a handful of plants that I use medicinally, and goldenrod is definitely one of them. So the flower um, is not the leaves. You can yeah, you could do you can do it with the leaves too. The leaves are more bitter. Oh. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the difference there. And actually, I use goldenrod in the spring when it first emerges. Now you got to really know your plants before you start collecting goldenrod in the spring because it looks like every other aster out there. Um, but they're, the leaves are really spicy and strong and they're tough. But if you, um, like I make a lot of fermented chili sauces and I throw a handful of those in there and it's like an extra dimension of spice. Um, you can th I throw them in soups and stuff like that kind of thing I do with the mugwort where I'm in the potage. I'll do throw a few goldenrod leaves in there too and give it a little spicy undertone. They're really peppery, they have a, a real bite to them, but it's not something you want to eat a bowl full of, but it's good as use of a spice. And there's a couple different varieties too, like this is a different variety. This is the... Um, uh, actually, is this the same guy? They, they're so morphy. No, I think this is canadensis, and I think this is the uh, not lanceolata, but the um, the narrow leaves goldenrod, uh, which actually they changed the genus on me. Um, hmm. Euthamia, I think it's called now. They're always doing that. I like to I use it so for seasonal allergies. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. It's the exact opposite of an allergen plant. It's mm -hmm. a it's an allergen fighter. That's why, mm -hmm. I, like, all through the fall and winter, I'll drink it as a tea. If I get like a mild sniffle or a cold, it just mm -hmm. seems to. I just make a tincture. Wipe it out. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, of course. The, no, the more sure. advanced way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Flower yeah. and top to make a tincture. Yeah, and you can use it. Too, yeah, of course. Yeah, if people are into tincturing, yeah, if people are into using plant. actual medicinal plants, all these plants, the same. it's the same applications. You just have to, you know, the process is different. I've never also been... Ragweed, too. Huh? Ragweed. Ragweed, too. Allergy. Yeah, exactly. With that, the whole, um, the idea of getting a little bit in there to, yeah. Uh, yeah, to, to well, defeat the, uh, yeah. the problem. Yeah, and as you can see, this whole field here is, is wild parsley. So you know, again, this is one of the, the other issues about that I like to talk about is that when we start to manage our land and and call, and not call, and divide, stop dividing plants in between wildflowers and weeds, and start thinking about which ones are invasive and which ones are native and which ones are useful, something like this could become a food producing area. It is a food producing area. We're just not collecting the food. Mm -hmm. But these parsnips right now. Uh, probably still have a lot of energy left in the root because they were mowed down early in the year and all they've done is pr produce a little bit of set of leaves. You'll see though, some of them are flowering. That's another good thing, especially with the APACA because there's potentially toxic members, is that because a plant is flowering at six inches does not mean that that's a six inch tall plant. That's a plant that was mowed. I've seen hemlock flower right here. Mm -hmm. You know, and, people, and you would look at it and you'd go, you'd look in your book and it would say hemlock, six to eight feet tall. <laughs> oh, that's not hemlock then. Mm. Oh, it's yeah. definitely hemlock, mm. yeah. Believes, you know, things are not, um, guidebooks are good, but lots of experience and lots of time studying the plants is better. That's really the big, biggest lesson about wild food is take your time. Do not run into this headlong. Learn something by watching it through its changes. Again, like with the mugwort, like how different is that looking? Looks really different from when it's small. I mean, how, how different does this baby parsnip look from the tall, dried out seed heads? There's no leaves left on it. You, know, you wouldn't know the, you know, or they're real withered. You wouldn't know the, the form of it without studying it through its changes. Um, and, uh, and, and that applies with sustainability too. I waited several years before I collected milkweed in my area until I realized how much there was. Then I went, okay, I'm good, you know. Um, but you also, also just toxicity or knowledge of a plant. Learning a plant is seeing it through its forms and its changes as it, as it matures. Uh, I usually, wa again, no one's gonna actually do this, but my usual rule of thumb is I wait a full season to watch a plant flower, uh, emerge. When I, in spring, it's all ID. I go out there and I go, okay, this is three tiny little leaves. What the hell is this? I don't know it this small. Figure out what it is, then watch it watch it mature, watch it flower, watch it go through its whole life cycle, and then next year I eat it. 
Um, but, you know, again, no one's actually going to do that. But that would be my actual... Legally, that's what I'm advising <laughs> you to do. Did you, did you say that you use the goldenrod seeds or the I haven't the used flowers. the seeds. That's, a, that's oh, an okay. interesting idea. Okay. Yeah, I wonder if the seeds could be ground into a flower. It would be, again, it would be quite bitter probably. But... You use the flour as a spice. Dry yeah, flour. yeah, oh. yeah. It's just, yeah, or like I've made vinegar with it and things like that. You can infuse it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh -huh. It's actually really good in honey. It adds yeah. like a, a bitter, mm. like a, like a nice kind of bitter floral dimension to honey. Uh, honey for seasonal allergies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. It'd be perfect. It's like a cure all. Yeah, yeah. yeah actually, infused honeys I really want to get more into because the ones I've made, it's like a wintergreen, mm, so good. And they often, yeah. um, because the plants all have wild yeast on them, they often add to a, a, the fermentation process that honey's mm. already always going through. Mm -hmm. So like, it's a great base for like a mead, say, or, you know, a, or a wine or whatever. Yeah, you can go that direction. So where should we go next? Is it a grape? Yeah, we got some more grapes. Yeah, aren't they great? I don't know what variety that is they got planted there, though. But I saw one yesterday. It's like it's almost rude. <laughs> There's wine berries over by that little bro. Oh, Are there? Nice they're, they're not they're still bearing. You no, know, they've got like a couple little little things hanging on there, but nothing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. ours died out a couple years ago. So. Um, mm -hmm. This, I think, is Riparia. Um, mm -hmm. When the Vikings came here, they called this country Vinland. Why? Because there's wild grapes growing everywhere. Mm -hmm. Tons of them. We have four really common species in this part of the country. This is one of the most common. This is supposed to be the most common one in America as a whole. It doesn't have any grapes on it. And very often they don't. People always ask me, why doesn't my wild grape have any grapes on it? I'm pretty sure it's a grape. Well, I just didn't get pollinated. And also they, you know, like vin like like the vines in vineyards, they, you know, the, the old growth is where you get the, the grapes. So you have to, has to establish itself and set a woody vine. Um, but yeah, we have uh, a million of these. This is Riparia. It's a little distinct because it has hair on the, um, the, the, uh, the, the main rib of the leaf, um, but uh, the other one that looks a lot like this is called Vetus vulpina, and that's the one that uh, is the wor has the worst reputation for a pretty good reason. It's really herbaceous, uh, really strong tasting. Riparia is pretty herbaceous too. None of our grapes are the grapes that people use for wine. The grape that they use for wine is a European species, Vinifera, v Vini Feria, so wine making. Um, but you can use all our wild grapes. There's, uh, the best one is the fox grape, Vitis labrusca. It's grown as, a, uh, as many cultivars, or used to be about a dozen cultivars. When we first came here and started taking over this land and eradicating the people that were already here, we cultivated a bunch of varieties of Vitis labrusca. We Catauba, Concord, there's a million different ones. They're almost all gone, like they're, they're in small people still, small handings still, holdings still make them, but Concord is the one that became popular. Um, it's called the fox grape because not because fox, foxes like it, but because the, the musky flavor of it is described as foxy. Hmm. I don't really get that. Okay, I've eaten a million fox grapes. I've made wine from them. I've made jelly from them. I've made jam from them. I, don't, I know they taste different than wine grapes, but I wouldn't say it's a bad thing. I would just say it's, it's a different flavor. Um, this, this, uh, this grape and the, and the Vulpina are very different. They're very herbaceous. They have a really strong flavor. They make great jellies, they make great jams. With any wild grape though, there's an important thing to bear in mind, which a lot of people don't know, which is that you have to process it in a certain way. You can't, you can eat them, that's fine, that's no problem. But if you're gonna make jelly, you're gonna make juice that you're gonna drink, you're gonna make jam, any of those things, you wanna juice them, press them, get all the, extract all the goodness and all the juice from them, and then you can use the peels for something if you want, like, you could make a grappa if you really wanted to. Mm -hmm. But you let the juice sit overnight in, the, in a mason jar in their fridge, and then at the bottom of that jar in the morning, you're going to find a chalky, thick substance that's called tartrate, and that is not something you want to eat. It's not poisonous, it's not, I mean, it might be poisonous in huge quantities, I don't know, but it's not toxic, but it doesn't taste good, and it's gritty, and it'll leave a grape, like, if you make a wild wine, uh, or you make a, um, a wild jelly from the grapes, it's going to leave a chalky, gritty taste to it. Uh, a lot of people I will, will post to go, oh, I just did a wild wine with seven pounds of, of uh, fox grapes, and I go, did you separate the tartrates first? And I go, what's that? <laughs> and I go, uh-oh, 
your wine ain't gonna taste that great <laughs> and you're gonna think you did something wrong you did but it's not something that people necessarily know it's a it's something that you have to learn they collect um, it in commercial winemaking as cream of tartar like yeah, at absolutely, the end they absolutely. scrape the yeah. fermentation tanks and everything yeah. and then they, they and then they sell it back to you yep. and then we oh, use as, it to make as, like, the, as they should yeah I mean, sure. that's that's full use right? yeah but um but yeah that's true it, it is in grown grapes as well I think the tartrate concentration is a little higher uh -huh. in wild grapes but I haven't worked with a lot of farm grapes so I couldn't 100% tell you that I'll tell you what though the most common grape in my area which is Vitas Vulpina is full of them uh, they're really chalky the main difference that you can tell when the fruit are ripe between Riparia and Volpina, it's not that important. When you know a grape, you know a grape. Um, is that the Volpina doesn't have a bloom of yeast, so the berries will be like black. Okay. And the Riparia will be, have the, that grape bloom that you'll see, which is just wild yeast. Volpina is still full of wild yeast, but for some reason it doesn't have a bloom. Um, there are some toxic plants that look like wild grapes, but none of them produce these tendrils. So a wild grape has a tendril alternating with the leaf. That's why it's such a great climber. Um, there are a, the, the real toxic look-alike to um, wild grapes that, that people know about is moonseed. Mm. Um, and moonseed, you think you, you're not sure what moonseed is? Well, the leaf looks really different to me, but I'm used to looking at leaves. The thing about moonseed, and you can remember it in the name, is if you crush one of those fruits and you look at the seed, you're not going to see a grape seed. You're going to see a little sickle moon. Looks like a little moon, and that's just a telltale. And then you'll know the plant, and that's the probably the best way to know it is when you see the fruit on it. To me, they also don't look like grapes; they hang in a different way. These, when this vine, if this vine had grapes on it, you would see very noticeable grapes. Oh, there's a mature pokeweed back there. We didn't do pokeweed, did we? No, mm -hmm. we could do pokeweed next. Okay. Is everyone okay with the sort of slow moving talking more than, or does it, or do you guys want to just like go into the woods? <laughs> All right, no, okay. Interested. It's a bigger it's a bigger group than I thought at first. I thought I had one person. So. <laughs> They're at 9:15. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, we could do pokeweed, but we got to go over there and maybe break a branch of this off. <clears throat> We're gonna look at this first. I wouldn't advise you to like lick it or anything. Like that. <laughs> this is pokeweed, which is famous, famous foraging plant, and one of the greatest wild foods there is. But not right now. Right now, it's very toxic. Um, it has a, again, there's a big bad reputation with pokeweed. You know, oh, it, when it's red, it's toxic. When it's branching, it's toxic. When it's flowering, it's toxic. When it emerges, it's toxic. It doesn't matter if it emerges late in the season, it's still toxic. Um, it's always toxic. You die. Um, until 2012, you could go into a supermarket in the south and buy pokeweed in cans. Huh. Huh. They stopped collecting it because apparently there weren't enough people doing it. They didn't meet me. Um, huh. But this is what it looks like when it's mature. You see, it's real tall. Yeah. And then the, eventually, this stem will turn bright red and really woody. It's not red right now. The reason why it's red or not red doesn't have anything to do with toxins. It's sunlight. When, when it's exposed, if you look, if you can see, you can sort of see red parts of it there. As it gets older and gets more of the area, gets continuously more exposed to sunlight, you'll see reddening. When I collect pokeweed, that's it growing in a pine forest, uh, where I find actually a lot of it. Uh, it almost never turns red until much later in its growth because it just hasn't hasn't produced enough of that whatever the particular coloration and you know enzyme is. I'm not sure, but you can see the both the flower. Well, this is a flower that's turning into seed, but these are the berries that are unripe. They're going to turn jet black. This plant looks really crazy when it's mature. Bright mm -hmm. red stem, jet black berries. So when can um, you use it then? We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna see that right over here. We're gonna okay. have to walk over for that. But but this is what she looks like when she's big. And this is a native plant. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a very common native plant. It's again like milkweed. It's a perennial. You can cut your pokeweed patch back every year. It's just gonna keep popping up. You gotta dig the roots. And the roots are what's really poisonous. Mm. Stay away from the roots. Mm. I've also read a lot of mythology about the berries being an arthritis cure. People drink a juice made from the berries or they eat a small handful of the berries every year. I wouldn't go there. Um, I don't tend to eat things that people make ink out of, mm -hmm. except squids. <laughs> but yeah, you can make an ink from the berries. That's what I would do with them. I wouldn't eat them. I wouldn't try making them into a jelly. Some people do it. Uh, I don't really potentially recommend it. Let's go look at this plant while it's young. What's the Latin name for pokeweed? Oh, it's uh, Phyllotaca americana. Uh -huh. There's a bunch of these around the world, but this is the native one. Pokeweed, 
Y L O H. This is what it looks like when it's lived. It's got a big field of it in there. Again, it's all growing from the same roots because this was mowed. This is not what pokeweed looks like this time of year unless it's been in a mowed area, maintained area. This is basically in the edible stage, although I don't tend to eat it this time of year, but that's more because there are other greens out that I like and I've eaten a lot of pokeweed already. And also, a lot of these, even though they're still small, are starting to flower. When it starts to flower, put out the flower, uh, it puts out a little tiny flower head right at the very tip of the plant and I don't tend to eat it. But the, the key thing about pokeweed is you'll read a lot of things about pokeweed that say you should eat it this time, you should eat it that time. There's a botanical distinction about when you should eat pokeweed. You see how this is just kind of flopping right over when I touch it? Uh -huh. So I'm going to pull it out so you can see the root too because the root is, this is the really poisonous part. So if people say, oh, if it's red, you shouldn't eat it. If it's red. No, this is what's happening. Okay. This is a, called a meristem. Okay, it's it's the like the shoot of a plant like you know how asparagus turns into a fern when it gets real big it gets woody the stem is really hard all the energy is left the stem this is that's a meristem you eat asparagus when it's a meristem you do the same thing with pokeweed when it's when it when it flops over like this you know it's good to go and uh, some people say you shouldn't eat the leaves some people should say you shouldn't eat the stalk I don't really have a problem with eating the whole plant the other thing for legal reasons I won't get too much into but I will hint at is that the cooking time you're going to read for pokeweed is a little bit higher than it really should be. But if you do try to eat pokeweed at some point in your life, and again, I would recommend you eat it in the spring, not now even if it's new growth, just if it's the first time you're trying it, be on the safe side. Um, I would recommend really boiling the shit out of it until it's like almost got no flavor left in it and trying it. If you still like it, then you can start to dial back the boiling time. But I would give it like, I'd boil it for a half hour, or the, actually the best way to do it here, best way to do it is actually put it in a pot, Bring the water to the boil, boil it for a minute, dump that water off, bring another pot of water to the boil, boil it for about 15-20 minutes. That's probably the, the lowest recommendation I will make. I will say that you can bet you can blur that line a little bit more, but don't do that at first. Get used to the taste of the plant, see if you even like it. I love it. It's like, I don't know, it's like a spinach with butter somehow infused in it. It's just soft, <laughs> sweet, mild green. It's so tasty. Uh, my favorite wild green, period, hands down. So I keep experimenting with it. I know people that eat it raw. I'm never going to eat it raw. <laughs> so you, you say it's good to eat once it shoots out that second yeah, node? Yeah. When this starts to get wooden and rigid, don't eat it. And okay. by then it'll probably have branched, which I is see. another thing. When it forks, I would stay away from it. When this flower, you can, like, we, get, we could pass this there and just please don't like handle the root too much. But you see it has a little tiny oh, yeah. baby. When I see that little baby, I stop eating and you should know what the root looks like because they get really heavy and if they're a dense patch, patch of them, but it's a long, sort of carrot-like root. But that's the really super toxic part of the plant. That's the plant that you would, if you ate a, a bowl of those roots, you'd probably be dead. So, and it, again, it's, it, it's, a, it's like anything else. The energy is key. You follow the energy. Toxins are a form of energy. They're a form of chemical substance that are produced in a plant as it matures. Usually the immature version is gonna be less toxic mature version will be more toxic but it also might be a lot more distinguishable when it's older so you get to learn it as it's older and whenever you find a mature plant that you identify like those wild carrots look around you because there's little baby carrots everywhere mm -hmm. and if you look in the grass here you'll see some of them um, and they look totally different of course but you start to see the connection as you study the plant more that's again why I'm a huge advocate of doing that can you speak at all to using the berries for dye I don't know I've never done it um, but yeah, you can use it, you can make a dye or an ink out of them. I would be careful when I handled it uh, for obvious reasons because I know in large concentrations they're, they're known to be, I mean people have died from eating lots of poke berries, so they're definitely, especially kids, so they're definitely yeah. known to be toxic. It's not a, there's no mystery about it. Um, but yeah, I would, I would, I don't think it's like skin absorb, you know, absorbing through your skin or anything like that. So I would think that, uh, you know, the most common use for it in the early settler culture was as ink. Uh, rather than a dye, but I have seen people get a successful dye from it. I actually should ask um, Carrie if she's tried any pokeweed dye. And so just so I'm clear again, you don't want to eat it once it starts shooting out that second yeah, branch? Once it's firm, the meristem is what you're looking for. Again, it should be like asparagus. You know how when you, if you've grow, you grown asparagus, 
or if you've even bought some at the farmer's market and you're preparing it, you snap off the woody parts. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to think about it. That's the okay. meristem is the soft, bendable. It's the, the delicate part, the, the part that you really want to eat because it's tender. Uh, when it gets start hard and wooden, you want to stay away from it. But redness doesn't have much to do with anything. Um, I've seen, I've eaten plenty of red pokeweed. Uh, some people also peel the skin off, which again, the first time you try it, I would recommend that. It's not a plant I would suggest anybody eat unless they listen to 20 other people first, not any, not like just a, me. Like uh, and that's true of everything, but especially something like pokeweed, which needs a lot of toxins. What time are we at here? Oh. So I think we're, uh, I don't know if people want to go to other events because this is my, the end of my scheduled time, but I'm happy to keep walking for a little while and talking if people are still interested. So we can see what else is growing around over here. It's a Native American plant, but it's not from here. It was introduced here as a popular quick growing, uh, you know, barrier tree or as a re-naturalizing area as they would plant black locust, but black locust ain't from here. That's, it's from the Midwest. Um, that plant is toxic. A tree is toxic, one of the very few toxic trees. It's in the pea family, the Baceae. That's a family to be careful with, like the nightshades and like the Abiaceae. A lot of peas are toxic. There's a plant called the rosary pea. People have died from sucking on rosary beads made from the dried peas. It's that toxic. It's also uh, ricin, if you've ever watched Breaking Bad, comes from a Fabaceae family plant. Black locust is toxic. Caster. The bark, yeah, yeah, castor bean. The, black, the bark is toxic, the leaves are toxic, the stems are toxic. The flowers are one of the five best edible wild foods there are. Mm -hmm. They are amazing. They taste like honey peas. They're perfect and beautiful and their season is about five days long. Unless it rains, then it's whenever the rain comes, you lose it. It's like the, one of the things I like, I'm out all night trying to get these things. And they produce huge clusters of them, I mean. And there's no way you're, you're, not, beat, you're not beating the birds because they grow all the way up to the top of them. Um, so you get whatever you can in reach. Um, the seed pod it produces also has an edible seed inside. There's a lot of debate about whether the pod itself is toxic. I haven't eaten the pod itself. I've eaten the peas. The peas are not toxic. Um, but in general, it is a rare tree in the sense that it has toxic components, toxic elements, and toxic parts. Most trees are, broadly speaking, really safe eating. They say food doesn't grow on trees, but it does. It both. So let's see what we got growing along the... Uh, what are your comments on honey sassy? locust? Um, as far as like, uh, the pods? I've used the pods. Um, yeah. Have you like tried to make the sugar out of that? I haven't. Like, I use oh, the pods to make a meat. I see. I've brewed with them and I made a vinegar with them. Um, you can infuse it. Uh, <laughs> it's um, it, They're really good. Uh, the thorns on the fork are just incredible. There's a spot that I know of where there's dozens of them. And I've looked at them for years and I'm like, I should do something. Yeah, the, the, I, I one of my favorite means I ever made was honey locust pods. There's uh -huh. an ornamental thornless honey locust by me in a park and uh, Ryu Maple. Yeah. Um, ornamental thornless. Yeah, yeah, it's because the, if you've seen, you know, the wild honey locust looks like the crown of thorns. I mean, yeah, it's, really, it's got the blue flowers and then I saw one of the ones that had the red flower, with like the pinkish flowers this year too. What is that called? The red robe? Have you seen that? Uh -uh. You should look it up. There's definitely some cultivars. It was, it's a popular it's landscaping a cultivar, I believe. plant. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and another thing, black locust. When you ID'd black locust and you go, oh, it's great. Black locust is awesome. I love these flowers. These are great. Ever wait, I just found a black locust with yellow flowers. That's golden chain tree. That's poisonous. Mm -hmm. Just because something looks like something else doesn't mean it is something else. Wait a minute. That doesn't make any sense. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. However, this is the, the one of the, the big <laughs> mamas of wild food for me is the maple. Um, Everybody knows you can make maple syrup from sugar maples. You can make maple syrup from every maple. Every maple can be tapped. Every maple has sap. So do a lot of other trees. Mm -hmm. But the maple is the king. Why? Because the sugar concentration is higher, so it takes less time to make the sugar out of them. That's the main reason. I don't really make a lot of maple syrup. I make some. I drink the sap. Mm -hmm. In Korea, they do it as a cleansing tonic every spring. Mm -hmm. They drink gallons of this stuff. They sell it on the roadside. Um, well, they do in South Korea. I don't know what they do in North Korea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, other parts of the maple are edible too. Um, the leaves are edible. When the leaves first emerge, the leaves are actually quite nice. I make a sauerkraut or kimchi from them. Chop them up. They have to be tender. Almost all tree leaves are edible. I wouldn't go eating every random tree leaf, but and a lot of them are really good. Beech leaves, for instance, are amazing. Mm -hmm. Beech leaves are lemony, 
they're like one of my favorite salad greens. And then um, basewood, tilia, mm -hmm. the linden, that has really amazing edible leaves. I mean, they're like God's own lettuce. I mean, they're just incredible. <laughs> um, also, the keys that maple produces have edible seeds inside. Now, I find almost all of them too bitter to eat. The silver maple, though, is very mm -hmm. different. Uh, get me a good bunch of silver maple keys, and you pop that seed out, it's absolutely delicious. I really encourage, though, to tap and use any, any Norway maple you want to, because mm -hmm. this is one of the few trees that's invasive. Uh, most of our trees that we see everywhere are native. Two of the big ones that aren't, that are invasive or semi-invasive, are the Norway spruce and the Norway maple. Mm -hmm. If you hear Norway in its name, it probably doesn't come from here. Um, but yeah, that's a great uh, edible... How about the flowers? Do you like the flowers also, of the maple? I haven't eaten them too much, but I've used them a ton to make um, infusions, infusions, especially vinegar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the Norway maple flower vinegar is like probably one of the more popular ones I've done in terms of people enjoying the taste of it. It has a really delicate kind of flavor. Um, I wish I used sugar maple flowers more, but there's so few of them in my area. I don't really tend to collect a whole bunch of them. Um, and I've done the fritters with the flowers too. You sure. can deep fry them and make the fritters. Oh, and yeah. another fun thing to do with maple leaf, especially, actually, surprisingly, I didn't realize this, I always avoided them because I was like, oh, it's an ornamental, it's not going to have much flavor. Mm -hmm. Japanese maple leaves are actually really tasty. Yeah. And they make a great tempura. Deep fry them suckers. They're yeah, fantastic. In Japan, they pack them in salt for like a year before yeah. they do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's like the, the Norway... They actually, have a German friend of mine sent me a recipe which was Norway maple leaf sauerkraut. <laughs> And I did that. I just just sliced them real thin, uh -huh. added a little bit of salt. Just do this classic crush and and uh, and get the juices out. Weigh it down. Leave it over a couple of weeks or whatever. And they're not leathery because you collect them young. You got to collect yeah. them young. Yeah. yeah. With all tree leaves, when they first emerge, that's when they're really edible. But you can still use them. I actually do. One of my favorite things to do, and it's really fun. And I, I think it's just because it seems kind of poetic, is to gather a bunch of fallen tree leaves in the fall when they're brown and they, or when they first are falling off the tree and I make like a broth from them. It doesn't taste like chicken broth. It's got its own unique flavor. Actually reminds me a lot of mushroom broth. It's got a woody, earthy kind of flavor, but a broth of fallen leaves. It's just, it, it's just charming. It's some kind, something to do to like make fall kind of like a little bit more magical. And then you also get a lot of looks because you're walking through the forest with a big bag of leaves. And <laughs> But yeah, most trees are pretty food safe. The beach is great for that. The beech leaves are amazing. In France, they make a liqueur from it called Noyau, uh, which is just beech leaves covered in vodka. Um, What's it called? Called Noyau, N-O-Y-A-U. I'm not sure, I'm probably not pronouncing it right. My French is so hot. But um, I don't see any oaks, but, oh yeah, there we go. But the oak is uh, probably the king in terms of acorns. Um, a lot of people know that acorns are edible, but the key is in the processing them. Um, you don't want to eat, it's not a nut. You don't, you're not gonna crack it and just put it in your mouth. Uh, I remember seeing, I can't remember what, maybe it was Walking Dead or something like that. It was in a TV show that I saw one time, I was watching at someone's house and it was, I think they were, you know, which, which you know, don't get me started on why they don't eat any plants in that show, but whatever. Uh, not one of them knows what the hell they're doing, but, but he, he tries to feed acorns to his kid and he just cracks them and they eat them and they go, because they are extremely bitter. They have tannins in them, which is the same thing that's in grapes. Not the tartrate, but tannins are the things that make wine its taste of bitterness. Tannins are also in coffee, lots of other tea. Um, with acorns, you have to process them by leaching them, which is you process them in either boiling water, changes of boiling water, uh, or you process them in cold water. The two methods I've found to be the best is collect yourself a lot of acorns. You don't want to eat the cap, just the nut meat. You shell them. To, and usually with acorns, you know, it's a lot of work to shell them, but the nut meat that's inside them is 90% of the nut. Mm -hmm. When you shell them, the shells are real thin. The uh, best way i found to shell them is heat a cast iron pan, heat the acorns up in a cast iron pan until they start to brown, then pull it off, let them cool, and then just pop them with the, uh, the flat end of a knife. It takes, mm -hmm. you know, it'll take you a couple hours to get enough to make a batch of flour, but I think it's worth it because I love the flavor. Mm -hmm. um, the two best methods to process them I use a hot water method when I want to keep the nuts basically, they won't stay whole because they, they, they fall into halves when you shell them. Um, but I like to use them as like a, 
almost like a meat substitute. Like I'll make like tacos or something like that. They work really good in um, like southwestern type dishes and Mexican type dishes. Like acorn quesadillas are fantastic. They got an earthy flavor. The way you process them though is um, you boil them in multiple changes of water. You don't bring them to the boil, you add them to boiling water. If you bring them to the boil, it fixes the tannins. Mm -hmm. So you will have a permanently better batch of acorns. You'll be boiling them and boiling them and going, what's going on, what's going on? Well, you fix the tannins in them. So, I mean, maybe hundreds of changes of water would get them out, but um, I like that method, but it's very labor intensive. Also uses a lot of water um, and it's kind of a pain in the ass, um, but you keep boiling them until they don't taste bitter. The key thing with processing acorns is you process them until they don't taste bitter, whatever method you're using. Um, the much easier way to do it, and I like the whole acorns, so I use both methods, but the way to make flour is you shell the acorns, you grind them, and then you cover them with cold water, and you pour off, don't pour off all the water, don't strain them, but a couple times a day, pour off the top of the water. You'll see a layer of oil that floats a bit above the crushed acorn meats. You can grind them up a bit, you know, you grind them up a bit so they're like a masa, like a thick flour. Uh, or like a chopped nut, like, what the, like if you buy chopped walnuts in a bag, that mm. kind of consistency. Let the, pour off a bit of the water, then add some more fresh water to it, let them sit. Keep doing that, keep doing that. Don't ever pour off all of the water because the oil is really what you want for your bread making, for flour making. Um, and then eventually you get to the point where they don't taste bitter anymore. And that's the key thing with acorns is the, the lack of bitterness is what you're looking for. Did we run out of time? Yeah, it's 11, so I don't know if everybody wants to get to their next events and stuff like that.